Marathon. Well, I'll try. Um, okay, so we're going to be giving them away, and since there are now officially more of you than we have things to give away, all of our slides have a movie quote on them. Ident the person who identifies the most movies wins, and if anyone gets all of them, I'll probably end up having to buy them alcohol at some point. You won't. You won't. But anyhow, I did a person who, two people who identify the most movies wins. And we can run through them later. It's not like we hate you so much that you have to write them down all the way through. That's a lie. We optimistically printed out 50 handouts, by the way, too. They're not, we're not going along them with our talk. There are 16 questions that you might be interested in if you're starting your own company, and they'll help you get along. But let's do introductions. My name's Micah Waldstein, um, case graduate in double major physics and astronomy, two fields that I now don't use whatsoever, um, except for the occasional Fortran programming. Six people, score. Um, except for the occasional Fortran programming, which is all that astronomers do. Uh, right out of school, worked for a startup tech consortium as. The title varied, but basically lead software engineer, managing the team of programmers there. Uh, and I also, since it was a startup, there was a lot of cross work in different areas. So I helped a bit with the business side of things and branding, which is what Nick was doing there at the time. Paul. Yeah, I w I've been uh, in startup tech companies for a couple of years now, like him. We've been doing. I've been doing director of business development, which is sort of a fuzzy title that encompasses anything you could possibly think of that isn't um, building a spaceship or something. It's a joke. No, okay. it's a bad joke. I didn't say it was funny. At no point was that funny. <laughs> so, yeah, so basically I guess what we, we can do next is that's, that's just my background, also a case graduate. Uh, we could set some kind of ground rule. There are certain circumstances where it really is the best option for a work environment. Any, any, other portal. any other questions while we're paused for a second here? And of course, like I said, you know, the, since the software itself is cheap, you can provide services at a premium at a price point where it's cheaper for your clients, and you still make enough money that at least you can live off of, and have enough left over to give something back to the community. Right, and you're not stuck into just like, if we've created X product, we're not stuck into just selling that, we're finding the best solution and on an individual basis for whatever the client, you know, whatever the client needs. So, I mean, I know this all sounds great so far, we probably move into things like, is this something I can do? Probably move on to the, the next, uh, did people knew this one other than Jim? Good, um, let's move on to the, let's move to the next slide. Okay. Okay. Anyone know this one? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> if if you haven't told, our main outlet is movies, and uh, we have fairly eclectic taste. But well, we'll tell you this one. This is Magic Christian, which is an absolutely amazing. This amazing is not movie. Magic Christian. No. Oh, I'm sorry. That's a dirty lie. You gave away one later on. If they'll be able to pick up which one Magic Christian is, well. They deserve it. That's Wicker true. Man. I'm sorry. Wicker Man. It's a classic. Oh, very classic. I highly, highly recommend it. It's being remade with... So, uh, let's not talk about the Nicolas Cage remake ever again. Never speak of this. It was perfect but the first time. Let's, let's go into, like, what, why we, you know, why we have this. Is we're talking about, is this the kind of thing you can do? How much, how much time of our lives is, what's the difference between work and other live or sleep? I know the difference between sleep and the rest of it because that's what I don't get enough of. Right. Starting your own business takes a lot of work. Why am I talking so much? Starting your own business takes a lot of work to do, um, particularly in the early phases. Because not only are you working on building the company, setting up paperwork, 
figuring out the infrastructure, doing your own accounting for a little while and similar things, but you're also working with trying to get, you know, clients um, sold on what you're offering them and you're trying to make sure that their solutions or whatever you're rolling out for them is the best it possibly can be because that's going to be your sales model later on when you start talking to clients, you know, three through five or so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the, another problem we're talking about is what you, what you need to do first is get some sort of past implementation that you can show them. You can't just go and like throw gorilla dust in their faces and they'll jump at it. You have to, you know, you have to have something to show them. And that typically means you're going to be either doing something, work for, for free or reduced or some sort of sample, like sample tests because you're looking for the next, next clients. Which obviously leads to how long can you live with a reduced income? Um, don't quit your day job or night job for while you're starting out your business. Um, particularly yeah. the politics side of what we're doing, you know, that's seasonal. Um, so there, we also have other branches, for instance, the government nonprofit that dovetails really well with the work that we do there. So making sure that you can live through those slow months, such as December, is a really good idea. Yeah, and it's just something, it's, if you need to be in certain, certain kind of condition to do this, you have, I mean, even, it's some, a little way, some sadistic. Uh, you have to be able to, you know, there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different things like, can I handle working a million hours in a week? Can I physically handle it? Some people can. It's not bad, you know, just, it's just not for you, not for you. Am I in a situation in my family? Am I in a situation in my life where... I can take the kind of time and time that it needs and requires, um, you know, and you can't, you just, it's just the, I cannot describe to you the pain and the amount of time it takes to work in a startup environment. And it, there, that's but it's very rewarding really and you'll love it every minute of it. <laughs> well, I, I mean, when, when, you, when you get into, when you get into this kind of thing, you have to know I can handle this. I am in a position in my life where I can do this, where I can take the time and where I can, you know, put myself in this. Um, plus sides why you why you would want to is you're working for yourself and it's the best thing you can ever do in your life <laughs> there and you're you, you can adjust your sleep schedule to match there are days when I wake up at noon and go to bed at four um, generally not when you're meeting with people but a lot of the people the clients who we end up meeting with you know they work full-time jobs and you know particularly in government sometimes they get very busy and so you have to meet with them after hours um, a lot of after hours meetings, a lot of weekend meetings. And that's when things get fit into place. The concept of day off is very is, is very difficult because we don't you don't really understand. It's not like you just cut out at a time. Like I've never had a time where I'm like, Well, it's six o'clock, we're just gonna leave. You know, it's what'll happen if, if I even are left at six, I'm gonna get a call ten minutes later, we're gonna be back working on something else. One of the Depending on you know you look at it, plus sides or downsides of getting involved in your own and starting your own business, is personally and some people can compartmentalize a little better. I can't stop thinking about this. Um, you know, wh how are we going to roll out this service in a timely manner, or how are we going to make sure we have enough bandwidth for the video streaming that we're doing, and. Or even worse is generally in the last half hour before I go to bed, I suddenly start coming up with, you know, well, shit, I just stumbled upon this new open source uh, project today that, you know, I can extend a little bit um, and suddenly, you know, market it a, as a robust solution to a whole bunch of new people. And then suddenly, you know, three hours later, I've found that maybe it's not possible. It goes both ways, I'll be perfectly honest. Um, some days, a lot of the times, for one thing, I don't even know where we are in the presentation anymore, but okay, we're, we're it, starts, it starts in a couple of different ways. For one thing, we're highly, highly familiar with the sectors that I've talked about. Government, politics, and nonprofits, and corporate IT. We've been involved with them in one way, shape, or form for a long time. I've been involved in politics since middle school in some ways. So we know the field and then, you know, it's just sort of been percolating for a while, you know, I can take this and translate it into something that's of value to people. 
And, you know, I've done that for free in the past before we had a company in place to do it. A lot of these things take a lot of training to give people, and that's one of the key value-added services. Now, the other thing, my core competency is that I check the Fresh Meat RSS feed every three minutes, and I know every single piece of open source software that's gone across it for the past four years. Um, so, for instance, when Nick calls me up and says, I've been talking to a guy who does construction and has no IT infrastructure, I can say, oh, you know, two days ago there was just a construction management piece of software released. We can probably, you know, find a way to work it into something usable for them. And again, I'm going to just mention that it's hard, finding the proper language when talking about open source software is hard. Um, because really what you're marketing to people is your knowledge and understanding, right? We have no IP. We have the most that we own as a company is a couple of servers at various locations. And, you know, the intelligence that we have between us and our experience. So when it comes down to it, you know, we're just selling ourselves, which is another side of the, is this something that you want to do? Are you confident enough in your abilities in whatever field you want to go into that you feel confident sitting down talking to someone and saying, I am the best choice that you have for getting this delivered? Yeah, and that's something we're going to go into just in a little bit is how to make yourself, make what you're doing as a company look, brand, and feel professional, feel like something somebody can trust to buy. Because in this situation, as, you know, as, as a consultant for a project, the only thing we're really, the only thing we are selling is ourselves and the trust that they think we are competent. And, um, you know, really, really what it comes down to is what that's the old, that is our core, that's the core thing we have. So, yeah. And uh, don't underestimate that. I mean, it's very important. People, particularly people who are not tech savvy necessarily value, um, value your intelligence and your ability to do things. I mean, just being able to, you know, put up a simple um, PHP program that has a built-in installer it goes a long way for a lot of people. Um, and it's not, the thing to remember, particularly coming from the open source world, is you're not ripping people off by providing them with advanced services or solutions they wouldn't get this information anywhere else. They don't have time to learn the nuances of the open source world and how it works and how you get support for things. And if you just serve as a conduit, you can get a, make a lot of business provided you find the right uh, field. Yeah, there's basically no way they would ever use open source unless they had something to support. I mean, that's the situations we're coming into. Um, I don't, when are we talking about proactively seeking clients? Let's, let's, let's move ahead. By the way, Cameron, one person's name I know. Um, we've got two books we're giving away. Identify the most movies and you win. That goes for everyone else too. Is there anyone who doesn't know where this is from? Good, good. You get to talk for a while because my mouth's getting dry. I think we've actually covered what we were going to cover. What we we're going to cover with with this slide as a backdrop. No. <sighs> so once you've identified what your skill set is and matched it to a market or an area that you want to go into, the next thing you need to do is make sure that it's actually feasible for you to follow through on it. Um, for instance, there's an asterisk talk later today. Maybe some of you are big asterisk people and, you know, I could go into, well, why did I bring up an example? I have no clue where I was going with that. Uh, go, go with an example like construction man, construction management or something like that. or something No, like you don't know where I'm going, so that doesn't work. <laughs> Let's say you wanted to go into, okay, this isn't an IT or open source solution uh, option, but um, let's say you wanted to go into selling you know, fast food hamburgers. Well, you might be really good at making hamburgers, but once you research the market, you'll find out that there's absolutely no way you can compete, um, basically. We, we can argue that point, but what you need to do is you need to find out, one, are there actually clients who I can talk to who will, who will buy from me in the early phases, particularly when you don't necessarily have a lot of examples? By the way, any, raise your hands. Anyone here been paid for web development, just design? What, what type of geeks are you? How did you pay for college? 
Um, huh? That works too. Um, web design is often a, just often a common way to get your foot in a door and get familiar with clients in one way or shape or form because chances are a lot of people have been doing it for a long time and you've got a portfolio to use. But that doesn't make any difference for most of the people who are in here. Um, know who your competitors are. There's a decent chance that the market is already saturated and there's simply no room and in order to get the jobs you simply have to underbid people to the point where you're not making any money and you simply have to keep a second to job on the side and that's just not worth it. Um, so know your market, know, know where you're going past the first year. You might be able to know where your first set of clients are coming from, but where's the next 10? Where's your next year's worth of clients coming from? Are you limit, going to be limited in geographic region for some, for some reason? I used reason twice in the same sentence. I was trying to work here. It didn't work. Um, Anything else to add on market research, or did I cover it pretty well? No, it was fine. I hate you. I hate <laughs> you so much. Um, you get to see the people. This is this is actually you know this will be a good transition to me when we talk about who you can work with and how you deal with working with people for all this time. I mean, clear. You know, I don't care. Like this is not like he. We we would do this like I hate you all, all day. Basically, is what it you know is because if people but that wouldn't be very entertaining not, for you, or maybe it would. <laughs> because people you're going to be working with, you're going to see all the time. They're going to have to be able to work with people constantly and not kill them. And that's actually a very sometimes that can be a very difficult. And that's a learn. That's a learned thing. It takes a it takes a few times of trying to kill people to learn that you need, shouldn't probably try to fight people. Just another point, which I'm going to make again, but I think it's important. Let's see. We've we've I've talked about value-added services. That was my first point that I'm going to repeat again, probably a couple more times. Mm -hmm. The other thing is be truthful and nice to people. If there's anything else that I learned at the first startup that we worked at, um, being truthful and being nice to people is a big plus. Don't tell people that you can do something that you can't. For instance, there's no way in hell I take on a job working on payroll for HR. There's simply no open source products that come close to the functionality of commercial ones or that can be rolled out in a reasonable manner that are easy to use. Not going to touch it. And there are a couple of other small fields like that too. The example that I was going to bring up earlier when I got lost for the m most recent time was you might be able to identify three clients that you can get in a market. For instance, what about, you know, ticket vending or something? You might, but once you've sold to the people that it's possible to sell to, maybe you're tapped out in the market. And which is why diversity in what you do is a good thing. I said that we do three major things, you know, politics, government nonprofit, and corporate consulting of various type forms. Yeah, you walk a balance, I'm gonna take that, you walk a balance between like where your core is starting and sometimes you may find that there's a need that you didn't anticipate working with these clients. and. You know, there's, there's the, like we said, there's a point where we know we're not going to go past that point, but there's always something. If there's an opportunity, if we look at it, we, is it feasible for us? Can we get it, can we get it, do the best for them? And if we can't, we'll tell them. Um, but you need to keep a balance of spreading yourself too thin will destroy you, but you don't want to limit yourself immediately. Like there's, there's a, it's a, it's an, it's an art, not a science, I guess. Yes, absolutely. And you have to know if we don't, okay, if we don't know somebody who we can subcontract to, I mean, there, there are definitely some nuts and, you know, nuts and bolts business stuff we do with, we do with that. Uh, which actually leads to a really good point. I remember when we talk about having friends who can do lots of things. Right now. How many people know this movie? Okay, good. Um, I don't think this was specific. No, we were this, is talk talking about about, this is talking about people you work with. Anyhow, um, make sure that you if develop a friends who have complementary skill sets. I don't do any Flash at all, but every so often someone really wants a Flash intro page. I've got a friend who I can kick that work to if I as needed. Um, I'm not a graphic designer. Every so often we need to design a graphics logo. I've, we've got connections into uh, CIA, the art school so we can throw work to people there. Um, and you know, just 
things like this. I'm, I know a lot of statistics, but I don't necessarily have the time to do it. Got a friend who majored in math and knows a lot and likes doing it, so I th we throw work his way when that comes up. Um, and, you know, they're all friends, they're familiar with what we're doing, and we know their availability for work, and we know their skill set really well. Um, yeah, that's a subcontracting side. If you have lawyer and accountant friends, really suck up to them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You can get away without having professional assistance. We're going to talk about this more when we get into the mechanics and the paperwork of how you file your company. You can get away with doing it for your own, on your own for a while, but particularly if you don't have any experience with MOUs, NDAs, MNDAs, um, and the intricacies of how corporate tax code is, finding a friend who can do that and buying them a lot of alcohol is a really, really good idea. Um, there was, a, you know, there was an article that I read recently by some CEO or somewhere or another, and basically said, you know, we did it blatantly wrong for the first couple of years, but we did eventually get, you know, assistance that helped us out. And you can go wrong for a little while. It's better to go right at the beginning. You know, but you should, but I mean, going wrong, you still can't, you still can't just lose things. Keep records of everything. Yeah. Good, good record keeping is key. As long as you're keeping good records, you can fix most things later. Most things. Basically, yeah. That's what that's basically what it amounts to. But should we should we talk? I mean, like we talked a little bit about comp complementary skill sets. I mean, you, you should really think about what what do, what am I good at? What am I not good at? What do I need to get? What do I need to get in this market or get where I see myself going? What types of skill sets do I need? Somebody that. You know, with with specific with specific uh, other kind of skills, I need somebody that can. You know, maybe I'm a terrible terrible writer or something. I need somebody that'll write press copy and you know, different kinds of like materials for me that uh, that I can work cheap. You know, or something like yeah. Or even you know, a more standard I'd say partnership is the tech guy and the sales guy, or the tech guy and the person who knows how to interact with clients and get clients. Because I think that that's one of the one of the issues that the open source movement is having right now is that there are a lot of projects that they formed organizations behind. You know, we sell support, and you run to it a lot of places, but they just put it up on their website and don't necessarily push out more. We're going to be talking about how to get clients, you know, one through five, a little down the line. We already sort of hinted at it. But making sure that you have someone who can do that work is really important, and I think it goes a long way to helping. And things. The other thing is, is they got to be excited about what you're doing, and they've got to want to be they've got to want to be committed, and they've got to want to put the kind of effort in. And sometimes that's tough when, you know, tough. Sometimes people aren't meant for this environment, and you have to learn how to tolerate and work with and get them integrated. You don't want to have if you have a couple people working really hard. And not somebody not pulling pulling their weight. It's not like you can say, "Well, you know, we have so much money. We'll go out to our HR department, hire somebody new, and I'll fire you." You know, you're kind of in a situation where you have to work with them, work with them very carefully to get them to work more, get them more excited about it. You know, and sometimes if, if someone is not willing to give up things to take the time to do it, it's going to be very tough to work with them. You may decide to make alternate plans. If you're committed and have the follow through to get things done and get things done on time, you're better than about 50% of the people out there, we found. If, as long as you follow through and are professional about it, you've got a great start. Is that, that true? Is yes, that good. that's true. <laughs> I make up statistics blatantly all the time. Oh, we made up that statistic, but it's probably true. <laughs> it's sort of a back of the hand checking thing. Any other questions so far on what we're doing? We do have, we did have, yes. What's your name, by the way? Okay. Oh, great. Okay, one of, in our specific field, what we do is we provide customized solutions. Before we have really any type of an agreement to do work or arrangement, we have a face-to-face -face meeting with them. Sit down, talk about it, make sure everyone knows exactly what's expected um, and exactly what they're interested in. It's 
I think as long as you do that, you're also ahead of the game a bit because making sure that what they expect and what they receive is exactly the same will really help build confidence in what you're doing a lot. Does that answer your question? I mean, the other side of things that you asked was how long will something take? It's roughly experience based. I, I don't know if I can say much more than that, you know. Um, we set the time frame sometimes, you know, we set the time frame collaboratively with them. Mm -hmm. So it really, I mean, I know it's a, it's a answer that's tough to say, but it depends on what we're doing and depends on what they, what their time frame is. And if it's something that we cannot possibly do it in the time frame, we would tell them we cannot possibly do it in the time frame, or we're going to subcontract to someone who can, and we, we know that can do it. This gets back to being honest up front with people because it's much better to say up front, I can't do it in the time frames that we said it's going to be, you know, an extra two weeks than getting to the deadline than saying it didn't happen. Yeah, and if you do something like that, it's a good idea to do some, something in good faith for them, either meaning like I'm not charging them for two weeks, I'm going over, you know, things like things like that. Okay, it depends. Dealing with politics particularly, which coming up, since we're coming up on election season, is what we've been dealing with heavily recently. Um, how much money they have often varies a lot. So we just tend to play a sliding scale game, um, depending on how important it is for us to get into the market that they represent, depending on how much money we expect them to raise, things like that. Um, we tend to do we tend to do hosting as time and materials and customization as fixed price per project. Again, with making sure that we really have the project well-defined ahead of time so that we don't suddenly have you know an extra month's worth of work on the end. I mean, it really does depend on what, what, uh, what sector you're in. If it's non if any kind of nonprofit, you really, it's very difficult to come with a fixed price. You have to kind of figure out what they have, what's reasonable, and if that amount makes sense for you to actually do it. And I'll say again, being coming at it from a open source side of things that you have a lot more wiggle room on how what you're charging because it's your time it's better most of the time to have work than not even if it doesn't pay very well um, particularly in the early phases of your company when you're going to want to have your name at the bottom of a lot of websites or have your name attached to a lot of things and send out press releases that say everything that you've done that you know have your client send out a press release announcing a new yeah. service if it's something public yeah I mean basically I mean I, I you know I know I know you're hitting at we don't turn down business we'll find usually find a way even if it's something we say this we can't do what you exactly want for that but we can do this the price will look good to you, you know, and we may have to subcontract to somebody that does something a little more simple. I mean, it, it just depends on the situation. Don't, don't get us, uh, mishear us, we're not trying to sell people things that they don't want, um, but sometimes people don't necessarily understand when it comes to tech. Again, I'm, going to, I'm afraid I'm going to have to stress it again, but in politics this is particularly the case. If someone wants, you know, a just something ridiculous when it comes to um, donor management, voter management, and uh, voter tracking. Helping them in the right direction is a good idea because if they win the office, well, yeah. you get the idea. Yeah, I mean, well, we and in some of the, it, it doesn't really matter. A lot of them are undefined. Even even some of the larger companies or yeah, any any of the our bigger clients really they sometimes don't describe well until we really hammer it out of them exactly what they want. And in that description period and figuring out what the deliverables are, often what they need will change and you'll find out that really they were using completely different terms for what you thought. Yeah, if you can find an example like show me this is exactly what you want. <laughs> <laughs> Could some staff member in the back of the room grab me water or something? That would be amazing. Thank you. Um, I, I guess you know we've called, we've part, we've gone a lot about like pre-company. Can I do this? So I understand market dealing with clients. Let's go into uh, a little more of like very technically what you how you start a company. You know, right now it's been sort of sort of working around it. Does anybody have any clue about this? Hmm. This, this is one of the ones that I expected no one to get. Not so easy. Okay. So. No. What uh, Not so easy. You know, some of the things you have to look into when you're starting is 
where am I going to file the company? What type of corporate structure works best for me? Um, Nick, let me interrupt you for a second. Okay. You file a company because you have to pay taxes. That's it. Companies exist only for monetary and okay and litigation reasons. Um, they provide a buffer between you and someone suing you, and it's so that you can accept money and not pay it personally out of as a um, use a, you, not using a Schedule C for you personally and paying ridiculous amounts. But anyhow, that's basically why you want to form a company. There are a lot of different legal entities that serve as companies. The easiest one is sole proprietorship. Then there's a partnership, limited liability, sole proprietorship, limited liability, partnership, li li limited liability, corporation, and then then you get into corporations like Schedule C corporations. AP Change, our company is limited liability, thank you so much, is uh, an LLC, which provides some measure of, I, I didn't see anyone cringe, but I suddenly noticed I was opening like I was going to spray all over the projector. Um, is a limited liability corporation, which basically means you can do, it's like a full corporation light, almost. You can, there are two different ways you can pay your taxes through it, either as an individual or through the company. You have a little bit of buffering from litigation, so they can't get your personal assets if you get sued. Um, if Particularly if you're going to business with someone else, it's probably the way to go. But. Worst case scenario, you form an LLC, and the LLC buys the sole proprietorship. Yeah, I mean, there's no, there, there's absolutely, there's probably no reason at all for if you're doing any kind of open source, open source work and consulting to be a corporation proper. Full Schedule C corporation requires a lot of paperwork to file. LLC, on the other hand, if you're filing in Ohio at least, it's three pages, which is basically your name a lot of, and address a lot of times, three or four signatures, I think, too, and $125. And you're an LLC. Um, okay, of course you have to wait for the Secretary of State to deal with it, and Ken Blackwell is slow. But that's roughly it. Sole proprietorships, even easier. Generally, you should probably register your company's name just so that other people don't run in and steal it. But since we're all dealing in tech in some way, shape, or form, if you own the domain name, no one's going to, else is going to try to take the name probably, except to register a company and then sue the name out of you, the domain out of you. But try to avoid situations where you're like that. Registering the name is about $50. It's one sheet of paper, I think. Um, you might be able to do it online, maybe. No, no, I think I should mail it in. Okay, that's a lie. Delaware, you can do it online. Um, other things to look into is where you're based. Where do you have mailing addresses that you can use that are tax friendly? Cleveland Heights is highway robbery. So our company is officially based in Medina County, um, which is slightly better. You do need an address there, or you need someone to do it. Um, law firms will do that and you know serve as your contact representative for your company costs money but if you're just doing it yourself you know it's something to pay attention to a lot of schedule c corporations file in delaware and new mexico arizona i, I think it's because they have very delaware. friendly corporate tax structures and you know a lot of politicians have been bought off to get it that way or something but those yeah. are just some things to think about. Um, so basically, if you're filing in Ohio, is anything other than, like, if you're filing as, like, an LLC or something that's not a full corporation, you don't need to pay a lawyer. And lot, some, people, right away. some people make a mistake of paying a lawyer to do that kind of thing right away. But no, unless you're running into something that you know I don't know what, I don't know what's going on here, or I feel there's going to be a problem, you do not want to waste that money. Here's a hint for if you're doing something, particularly if you have competitors who are sort of at the same level as you. Chances are your Secretary of State, definitely if you're in Ohio, if you're in an, most other states do as well, they have business searches and those forms are online. Look up your competitors' forms, take a look and see you know, how they filled theirs out. And particularly for LLCs where it's short, you can just take a look at a lot of them and learn how to do it very quickly. Because like I said, it's your name, signature, and $125 a lot of times. Not the hundred twenty-five dollars signatures. There's some other things that you're going to need to do at filing that aren't legally required but are really good ideas. 
business plan. <laughs> you're going to want a business plan. You don't, if it's just you, you're probably okay getting away with that one with, because all the money that you make goes to you. Um, yeah, you should still if you don't make clients, where you're going. Yeah, and actually, the the sixteen questions you should ask yourself when starting a company that we have sitting up here are probably a good starting place. Um, business plan can be really simple. It's just who, where are my clients? What am I providing? Why am I doing this? And why is what I'm offering worth something to anyone? Particularly if you ever need um, funding from someone for some reason or another. If you need a loan from a bank, if you're trying to get VC, don't. Um, you need... We should we should probably explain why that doesn't make any sense. A VC doesn't make any sense in this context. Steal from your friends and family. It's. I think it's... You know, we, we, we really think it's a good idea to just go work up yourself. VC is not a good idea, especially what we're doing. We're doing we don't actually have IP. So if you have, if you're going for VC, you're going to be asked, you're going to be answering to someone down the line, basically, who's like, "What are you doing with my money?" And your company may go in directions that you didn't necessarily intend it to or want it to, and it will be out of your hands. Because hopefully, that's the reason that people end up starting businesses, particularly at this level, is they want to be in control of what they're doing and, you know, be their own boss. Try to keep it that way, I think. Um, and most of particularly in open source where you have low startup costs, you should be able to get away without needing upfront funding. It's really tempting, particularly if you think you have something good going, you know, get lots of VC, buy Jaguar. Um, but remember that you have to answer for that down the line. Um, and you don't get free money ever. There's no such thing. Um, so anyhow, having a business plan though, if you need a loan from a bank for some reason, if if you're doing video streaming, for instance, and need to drop a, uh, you know, an OC3 somewhere or something ridiculous like that to get the bandwidth that you're going to need, chances are, if you don't have massive savings, you're going to have you might need to get a loan for that. A bank to give a business a loan, particularly if you aren't very well established. Okay, two things. One, they're going to want to see your business plan and make sure that they're going to be able to get their money back, and that. The way that you interpret that is from the business plan. And the other thing is they're going to want to see that you're up at fronting money in some way too. Um, has takes money to get money, something ridiculous like that. Yeah. yeah, you have to you have to have money to get money, and it it so it's kind of like you you try to you try to work your you try to work your way up from from nothing, but you really to move out and get more capital, you have to have capital in there, and that's why it's this is pr this is why things fail a lot. But it's not. It's not on. You know. It's definitely the best way to go. I don't think VC is the right. I don't think that's the best right way to go. But that's just us grinding an axe. Um, any other? Another thing that you're going to want to have in place is um, constitution. No articles of incorporation. Uh, you need what's in the word by yeah. bylaws. Bylaws. Yeah. Bylaws. <laughs> you don't need if, that. If you can't, haven't been, can't tell. I've been working on filing a nonprofit recently. But um, you need bylaws because right now, if we had a major falling out of some type, I think you get everything because your name was on the check that went to the state. But you want that, you want to have some type of, yes, you can have our servers. <laughs> <laughs> because again, we have no IP, so he doesn't get anything at all. Um, but if you do have some type of falling out, your bylaws are what protects the members of the partnership from... Uh, from evil, evil people like Mr. Hannock running away with all of your hard-earned work and client lists and things like that. Um, and just having that background in place. Anything yeah. else we need to um, and The only other thing I think here would be just the things we, we glanced over is like uh, um, NDAs and MOUs and things like that. Like always, people will screw you over. Just any but chance they in government. No, anywhere. Uh, they don't care. Any, anybody, anybody you're talking to, especially if you're working with someone else. For example, we were talking subcontracting. We're subcontracting to a company or something. We don't do anything unless we have a, a non-disclosure agreement. Do they hold up? Well, you know, sometimes. But it's just basically, it's basically some layer of protection that says you're not going. You cannot screw us over. An MOU helps a lot. At with least that without too. a fight. You know. Um, particularly because as a small business, you can't afford good lawyers. Um, or possibly even lawyers at all. Get it. One of the things that you're going to want to spend money on with a lawyer right away is, you know, help me write an NDA and help me write a standard MOU. NDA, if anyone's not 
familiar with it, non-disclosure agreement, often you'll end up, if you're working with another business, uh, MNDA, mutual non-disclosure agreement, basically just says that things you talk about with each other have to stay between each other and you can't profit off of it. And there's all sorts of different legal terminology clauses that get thrown on there, like non-compete agreements, which are ridiculous and you should cross out and make sure don't exist on any thing that you sign. Yeah. yeah. MOUs is just sort of, think about it as contract light. Um, memorandum of understanding? Yeah, you need, to, you need to have something, just something written down. Uh, if Billy or whoever you're working for says they're going to pay you $500 or something, you know, or, you know, just makes the terrible example. If they don't write it down, they'll be like, oh, what? You know, if you're not written down, you have absolutely nothing. Make them, make it written down. I mean, sure, there's trust. They have to trust us to want to give us business. You do not have to trust them. Make them write it down. You need to. Unless it's in paper, it didn't happen. Don't trust handshake agreements or, you know, oral contracts or whatever, because again, that requires a lawyer in court to resolve if there's a conflict involved. Um, it, if it's in paper, no it, one can it argue minimal about it. Have it, it, it. Minimal, you would need it in an email. Like, please outline exactly what we're doing and send it to me. So at least there's some sort of record. Buy a fax machine so you can fax these back and forth with signatures on them. Fax machines are cheap. Um, or plug in a computer. Um, there may be. Um, the trouble is that MOUs change from contract to con or from business opportunity to business opportunity based on what you're providing and what the agreement is. Uh, maybe. I'm sorry, I, I can't answer that better. Nick, do you know? Uh, no, I don't know. Okay. We're not lawyers. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the same thing is like, do not take anything we are saying as legal advice since neither of us are actually lawyers. We're also not accountants. Do not sue us for anything involving your legal or financial matters. My, my rule of thumb when it comes to accounting tax matters is if you think that you found, up, found out something clever to do in accounting or with taxes, it's probably legal. Or yeah, yeah. So don't, don't try to funnel funds around in funny ways. You'll just get screwed later on. Yeah. And then just keep track of everything and not, don't mess, they'll, they'll get you. <laughs> and that's just a, just a matter of time. Remember they, that unlike individuals, um, the IRS, it's much more likely for a business to get audited by the IRS. Um, so having decent records is a really good idea. A really good idea. I'm not speaking from experience right now, but well, it, it would suck a lot. <laughs> yeah, we haven't had that yet. Um, so I think we can. Are we up to our, our quick yeah, we'll break? Take. Good. Take a break. Let's let's take a quick break and grab you know. I, I need to go to the bathroom and drink more water. So. So we'll take we'll take like five minutes if that's okay. What, what do we know? Can I turn off the wireless microphone? What? Yeah. Got it. I know that now. <laughs> Go for it.
gets one of the last ones, I think you would automatically win. So you, you get a little more. We, we, we pull back ropes here and then it goes to the previous. Yeah. It's very possible. Yeah. He's back, so... Hmm? get started again quickly but in you can do it two ways um, first of all you'd be owners so you can get the profit from the company um, 
it, it basically becomes a tax issue, or the company can pay you guys um, based on whatever scheme. Yeah, so you'd have to actually keep W fours. Or would you do like ten ninety nine? It's it's up to you. Um, yeah. you but you do. I mean, it depends. the difference is, is would the company end up paying some amount of taxes? Basically, it would end up being a 1099 if you just take profit as the owner of the company. Or you could have the company pay taxes and then give you W-2s, but then you have know, W-4s on record. And that's the get it and count friend, basically. At the lowest level... Um, well, because was give me a uh, last year. Where are you from? Okay. Um, so I did work down there last week. Yeah. And like I said, I didn't get history. Okay. Um, and he tended to get history. Just because yeah. I was doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what so happens tax is. Tax yeah. Tax yeah. Places. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, that's, the, I mean, that's the advantage of the structures. Mm -hmm. Well, you would work out you're, you're your partner. If the person pays yeah. something, you're going to have to like work out and yeah. then get it done. You have to get down the paper too. Otherwise, you, you know, just you never know. Something like that. The yeah. way to handle something work for it and pay. Yeah, let's see that. Okay. 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 Well, let's, let's I didn't yeah, know no, you guys. It's okay. okay. Hey, Jim, sit down. We're gonna get started. Cool. <laughs> Maybe your cue. Yeah, well, that, that's the cue. Jim, sit down. We're gonna get started. It works pretty well. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Alton, for the water. But um. Some percentage you could have to one. Anyone? Okay, one, good. one? Two. You guys don't count. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, okay, we're doing better, but we use this one twice, which is twice. So, one of the most important things you can do is so I have a company. Uh, so I've got the best, uh, I've, got a gr I've got a great uh, skill set, I've got great people. If people don't believe you are a company and you are, you are very serious, they will not take you seriously. So what we're gonna t we're just gonna go into what branding what branding means, like a top level overview, how you can make yourself look very good and professional as a company quickly without, um, you know, without having an entire communications department or something. If you yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We we spent a lot of we spent a long time thinking of names, and it is a, if you ever thought of a name for a company, it's a very painful process. It takes a long time, and it's very hard. I think we've had a name in working different startups. We've had to name three or four different companies, and we've only made maybe in about days and days and days and days of work, maybe one or two good names. The trouble is, is that. My name LLC, or you know, uh, Michael Waldstein, or Waldstein Hannock Consulting, or things like that. Suddenly, instead of selling the company, you're selling yourselves again. Don't get me wrong; you're always selling yourself when you meet with people, but the the illusion that you create, and I use illusion in I don't know hesitantly, but. You want to come across as a professional, as part of a professional organization. This isn't something that you've just been doing out of your front room of your house, even though maybe you are. Right. But they, they don't want to, you know, they, they need, they, you can't invest in something as your client. They can't be like, well, if this guy gets hit by a car, I'm doomed. But he's got this giant corporation behind him now that I feel very confident in. It goes back to, the, the flip side of course is don't lie you know, if they flat up ask you, answer them, but feel feel confident in what you're saying. If you say that you're going to be around for, you know, the next five years, make sure that you really believe that you're going to be around for the next five years or minimum, or that you have people who you know will be around in the next five years who can take that job over or take over providing support to this particular client. Yeah, if they ask you how many people do you have, don't you know? Don't shrug and be like, oh, I have, I have three hundred. <laughs> yeah, you know, don't say don't say three hundred. But if you say three, make it sound like that is the best decision ever, and you intentionally had three, and you wanted to have three, and that is the only way your company could possibly operate. I have three. No, so that's not. Honestly, I 
I honestly believe that smaller companies are better. If you only have three people, it's good. If you need more people, outsource it to other people all right, and subcontract out when you have to. By keeping small numbers of employees, you get to uh, save on the paperwork. Yeah, and you just you don't want to go paying people before you need them. You know, you don't. There's it's a you need the money to expand. You need the money to expand. You don't need to expand. It's not a big deal how many you have. What's a lot of, a lot of people get caught up in like I have a company, this many people working for me. Well, how much money are you making? You know, you should be your concentrate should be on the bottom line. Like I, I have two people, so I make a lot of money. And that's that's a hard jump to make from I want to help people out to I need to get paid for helping people out, um, particularly as you know tech geeks or open source weenies that we are. You know, we're really used to providing large amounts of free labor to different people. Well, if you start approaching companies or other organizations, you have to make the transi transition to I should be paid for my time or you know, maybe I'm going to be contributing what I do back to the open source community, but congratulations, you, you need to bootstrap that it, to get us there. Yeah, and you know, to go go back to how you present how you present as a company, uh, you you need to be sure that you can tell somebody exactly what your company is very quickly and succinctly. You know, you don't want to give confusion. If they're not sure of what you do, they're not going to be sure they want to hire you to do anything. So they need to be very comfortable in what they're getting. They need to know, and it's it goes along with the being upfront, upfront and honest, and just very you know very matter of fact about it. So you have to. You know, you have to be very sure of what you're doing. Make sure people are presenting themselves the same way. If you have, mul if you're starting with multiple people, make sure you're saying the same things. If you contradict each other, it's going to be, a, it's, it's a problem. If you don't want to contradict, you never want to contradict to a client. Like if you know, let's say I went in and said this is the best idea ever. He's like, I'm not so sure. You know, we would look terrible. Always, always plan and prepare that we are going to look the same. We are not, never, you know, never going to argue. You're never going to see us argue in public unless it's funny. <laughs> uh, and you know those are those are just the uh, those are just like the verbal the verbal communication side. There's also the logo name print side. Make sure you have a logo that looks the same on each of them. Get a business card on day one. Um, I can't stress that enough because the instant you talk to someone, if you if you're at a professional organization meeting of some type, for instance, maybe you've gone to a small business people's meeting or, or and you're talking to people you're going to be asked for your business card and it's kind of embarrassing to say oh can I just write on the back of one of yours actually you say uh, I've got mine back in the office my it was in the other I ran out this week I ran out this week uh, it's a terrible feeling we went one of the companies we had worked for for a while we didn't they're really I don't know if they're cheap or what the problem was but you know we always fight them like we need business cards because you go into these meetings we were going in with like big corporation execs throwing on a card and I'm like let me it, write it on the paper yeah it, paper. Looks, it looks terrible you hand them a car this, nice card people go wow business cards are cheap too by the way yes. if you hunt around you can I think we got a thousand for forty dollars including a union logo which it's important when you deal with uh, government and politics to have a union bug on it, but you can get them even cheaper. So buy business cards. It'll really and the it's it's another level of professionalism that will help people really buy into that you're part of a company and that you are a company. Yeah, the logo on your the logo on your your documents, your presentations, your press releases, your MOUs, your NDAs your website it all needs to look the same because then it looks unified they always know what they're going to get when they see something when they see something different it looks like they're just screwing around if you see if it's obsessive it sounds it sounds insane but it it is it is not it's it creates a bad impression if you see different kinds of branding for the same thing we have the same you know we have sign email signatures they look the same this we're getting into now you know one of the things that i think we've both learned working at other companies is that there's good parts of corporation, corporate culture, and then there are bad parts. Recognize what the good parts are, and either you know, don't make a complete joke out of some of the things that are just completely asinine. Particularly for a smaller company, you can do things like signature standards, which you know are the bane of many people's existence, easily since it's just the two of us talking to each other, or you know, 
talking to some of the other people that we work with. And that's a benefit of being small, is you can get everyone to change quickly, and it's not, you know, sending out TPS reports. Yeah. That movie, by the way, is never used in a slide. Sorry. It's, you know, it's something like, you, even if you if you go and work if you've worked for a large corporation or you know you know that they're very paranoid about how they how they appear and that's because they appear and but think of how the oppression comes you never think they're small you always know they're big and you always know this is something if I work them I know what I'm going to get for better for better or worse but if they're coming if you're coming in a very consistent consistent branding they know what they're going to get from you they can it helps encourage that kind of trust that you need especially with the kind of business we're talking about here. So the follow-up and what's directly on the slide behind me is that but the inside doesn't matter. And again, this ties into what I, where I feel, why I feel that there's benefits to exploring open source solutions, support, hosting, value-added, things like that, is that you can do lots of great things, but if you don't bring in clients or don't proactively seek clients, it doesn't matter. And if you don't let the rest of the world know what you're doing, it doesn't matter. I could have the most powerful piece of software ever made sitting in my computer, but unless I put out a press release about it, it no one will ever know. Just putting it on your website isn't enough. You have to proactively um, engage members of the press, members of the media, um, and prospective clients to get it out there yeah, it, and start snowballing. More importantly, you're just getting a message to your client base. Like the client base, however you get it out, it may not. It's not going to be, a, you know, there's not a standard way to get things to get things out sometimes. But you need to do something with the intent of someone has to see it and know who did it. Otherwise, it's you didn't do it. And I'm going to stress again the press connection because it's something big in my on my, my mind anytime you do with something send out a press release maybe it's not the press release where you call up the reporters and nag them about getting a story in about it but just send out the press release make them start to be aware that you are doing big things in this area with people who maybe are press worthy it, it should be it should be or in the industry field you're going into get it out there get it out to people organizations that will care about it like if you're going into gardening, you'd send it to the Gardeners Association. Press releases are not just for press. Send them to other, you know. Yeah, get it, just get it to the people that might want to hire you. Anyone. Worst they do is ignore it. Yeah. Or shred it or, you know, pick you up on your grammatical mistakes and spelling errors and find a good copy editor. Yeah. I highly, highly urge to that. Yeah, get a good copy editor or just, you know, take your time on that. One spelling mistake will just, it's, it just looks terrible. I mean, you never, no matter how smart you are, when you make, when you misspell a simple word, people think you're dumb. Are we moving on? That, that being said, there better not be any spelling errors up there. I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are. It's the same movie as before, so the same number of people probably still know it. Um. Oh, oh, oh. We, we did that in purpose. It was the spelling joke leads right into that. Good, good. Um, I made the slides. My spelling's atrocious. Sorry. And this is, this, so this would come back to, you know. I Man, you, you screwed us over good, yeah. Nick. <laughs> I'm just going to blame him for everything from now on. All good. I'm so, take the okay, so the we, one that's we talked about. <sighs> We, we talked about a company, you know, about your company branding. Now we need to talk about personal personal branding, how you deal with clients, and how you look. It's superficial. It seems dumb, but it matters, and it matters a lot. Which it's it's. I mean, we, we intentionally we know it's we know it's dumb. We we know we like, it's not something we really enjoy doing. It's why we put a picture of a mass murderer up behind us. Um. So I had a problem with my laptop uh, earlier in the week, and the Dell service representative came out and re amazingly replaced the entire motherboard in 20 minutes. I was fairly happy, actually. But I think he was a pretty good example of some things that the tech community um, is weak on. Uh, he was he was wearing you know 
professional office attire. I, I'll give him that, you know, blue shirt, tie, and everything's fine. Then he was wearing, you know, a circuit board tie. If you're talking to the CEO or CIO or chief financial officer of an organization, don't wear a circuit board tie or tie that has binary on it or, you know, try to avoid a penguin too. Um, any other suggestions? Oh, ties that say sex, except that it's hidden into the pattern in some way, because they'll notice it. Joke ties are not appropriate for business meetings where you're trying to sell people something. And it, you know, it depends on the environment who you're selling to. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's sometimes. I mean, we don't want to go into an entire fashion fashion clinic here. You don't necessarily need to. You have to but know. But do's and don'ts to wearing a bold striped tie. Um, so I mean, depends on depends on the industry in terms of the meeting. I mean, typically, you know, we don't really we don't really wear ties that much, but we do have. It's always important to have a suit in case you know, in in, in case of what you where you need to be, what you need to be doing, where you're pre, where you're where you're going to be meeting people, because you really only get how many chances for somebody to think you're smart, and unfortunately, how you dress relates a lot to how smart people think you are. Remember that when you're selling, essentially every meeting that you have with someone is a job interview. Think about how you dress when you go to a job interview, and you'll probably be okay. Um, it's unfortunate, probably, that you know people don't evaluate based on merit more, but that's why we're spending time talking about you know branding and personal attire. And I'm not going to mention hygiene, but hopefully you all shower on a regular basis. But um, if, if you're seeing a client look good. It's just all it comes down to. I mean, no matter what, you know, don't ever be like, ah, oh, you know, I've seen him before. I'll wear uh, sweatpants. You know, I'm just you need to you need to look look the part because you need to act like I am a CEO. I am the vice, you know, I'm the president. I'm the vice president of this company. If you don't act and talk like that and be that, you're not. They're not going to think you are. They're going to think, oh, this is a joke. He's not taking it seriously. I'm not going to take it seriously. Or you know, she's not taking it seriously. Um, we talked a little bit about personal like dress, and I know it's something we focused on. We focus on a lot because we really think it's important. But there's also demeanor, how you handle yourself, and how you act in terms of like a meeting. For example, there are jokes that we've made today we would never make in a meeting. Um, you know, there may be the best joke. You know, it depends on it depends on the level of the meeting. But uh, you know, you just you have to act like what you're doing, and you have to be. You can't argue with them. Go, oh, no, that's stupid. You don't do that to a client. You don't do anything silly like that. Being a good communicator again is one of the more important things you remember you don't have IP that you can sell them you don't have any particular product that you can push besides you know yourself you want to be able to work with everyone um, and probably you're starting your own business to get away from an asshole boss or something like that but you're going to have asshole clients well Unfortunately, now they're your client, so you want to avoid pissing them off because who knows who their friends are? Who knows how much more business you can get if they like you at the end of the day, even if you don't like them? Something one one of our one of the first internal policies we set was never argue. We I, joke I, about internal policies, but they're sort of legitimate. Yeah. Um, there are ways. There are ways you can. Let me. If I had a client, if I had a client that was saying, I, "I'm going to," client that said I didn't like that would possibly cost me business by keeping them. A few things I would pro I would deal with. You know, you would not always deal with them in a positive manner. There are ways to deal with negative situations in a positive, constructive manner, or at least a neutral, not "you're stupid," which is tough because that's generally the first instinct. The first instinct is go for it. Just make fun of them. You know, or go at them, and you, it does no good because in an argument, even if you win, you prove your point, you lost. That person's not going to like you; they're not going to be happy, and that's the person you've got to have as your customer. But for that situation, what you would do is there's a bunch of create there's there's some creative ways that you could do it, and one would be to recommend them to someone else, deal in a professional manner to go. You know, I, I think your needs would be best served by my competitor. I'm afraid right now we, we have uh, too much work on our plate and some major uh, deadlines coming up. You're going to have to look elsewhere. Or, you know, um, help, I'd happy, happily recommend them. You know, recommend someone for you. If, if, that's the if that's the case. And I really, those, 
there should never really be that kind of case where someone is so unhappy or terrible or because hopefully you're providing a service that they actually want also yeah I mean a situation like that would be rare if you know work you work with them you find a way if they want if they whatever they want you find a way to make them happy and that's ultimately what it, that's ultimately what it comes down to and it's you know and like especially when we're talking with we talked a little about secretary proof we talked about people that just don't know you don't know who you're going to be talking to and dealing with your primary contact may not be technical at all they may have their tech their capabilities may be limited you don't know so you kind of have to you know uh, just all they have is that you're responding and listening to them so you take your time making sure you're there understanding exactly what the, is they're saying we, even if they don't really know get them to the point where they can you can determine and kind of tell them like how about this and then you know so something like something like that is just but dealing with them dealing with them very carefully and making sure they know exactly what you're doing make sure they understand what you're doing and they're comfortable with what you're doing I mean it's it's a hard habit to get into when we're used to arguing about licenses or ridiculous things like that or why Perl is better than Python or stuff like that but you know come at it from a different approach you know whenever defray arguments before they start understand what their point of view is and just keep your eye on the bottom line is they need to walk away from your services happy remember they're your client the client isn't always right but you can make them feel like they're always right yeah and don't uh, and be sounded really profound and I'm so happy <laughs> and don't insult other other competitors don't insult other don't set a situation where you to argue someone if they say I was always trained that this this product was the best and nothing be go yeah it's pretty good then they can't argue anymore you go yeah it's good but look at what I have you know you stop their argument they can no longer argue you then you can show them what you actually got there for. There's no point arguing. It's a hard, hard thing to do, and you will have to deliberately train yourself not to. Are we ready to move on? Yeah, I Good. think we've I think we've taught everyone to look pretty and not make fun of people. Yeah, and make deals with the devil when you have to. Right. <laughs> Anyone in this movie? He have. You were part of film society, weren't you? So, okay, good, good. Um, it's Kevin Spacey there. That's Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin's crotch. Am I ringing any bells? No. <laughs> um, we've really covered everything that we were planning to talk about on this slide. Well, not. No, okay, no, then you no, can start no, talking. We, uh, we we talked about we talked about all the marketing. We haven't talked about how you go out and get clients two through five through six through so on and so on. We've gotten the point. Okay, they've seen you. They see you. They say this person is professional. This person is good. I trust this person to take care of whatever it is I need them to do. Okay, how do you you know we talked a little bit before. We mentioned for your first one, you may have to take a little bit. You may have to take a little bit lower. You may have to do some sort of test. You have to do some sort of test implementation. Once you get that, you need to go out. You need to go out aggressively. You need to meet people. You need to follow up on any kind of lead. This is basically telling you, if there, if there was a chance that you met someone that you might get business from, you had better follow up with them and follow up with them. If they write you an email or they call you. You get back within 24 hours. You get back right away. You have to every time. You can't. I mean, there's no. That's what. That's where a lot of this destruction of your life comes in because you know I only have X amount of time and I have to hustle. You know, I, I have to, no matter what I'm doing, I have to stop and take a take a call anywhere at any time whenever they call me. We now have a third book for those of you who are checking, counting. We can pretty much, uh, I think the next one is going to be where we really, if anyone gets it, they get a book automatically. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other things is, so that's how once you've met the person and you work on developing a relationship, how do you find the people to begin with? Um, when you find people to begin with, a lot of times it's going to be something you personally know or have an idea. If you're thinking about a business, you've thought about your first places. You know, I don't think any, I don't think anyone would go into it, or it wouldn't be smart to go into it. Like if I just going to do something in a, like in, in this type of environment, you know kind of where you want to go. You know someone that's doing it. You say, hey, 
you know, I know you really wanted this. I could do this for you. We can do this at a lower, you know, you just pay for my time, basically. Tell them why you're doing it at a lower cost, too. Yeah. Like, this is a market that I'm just getting into. Don't say that they're your first client, but this is an area that I'm getting into. And so I'm willing to provide this, you know, at cost. Um, in exchange for you know helping pu publicize something like yeah, that, yeah, and you want you want to you want to be able to say you do want to be able to say look at what I did for for Joe client, but you don't want Joe client going around saying this is what they did for me at this price. So you know there's that so you need to make sure they understand they understand that, and you know like we said the next things you need to find creative ways to get to get attention and get into the into the market you're doing. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of different ways you can do that, and I'm sure you've seen things companies things companies have done or will do that you know to get attention. But a lot of it is just following up on anything that even might possibly be something just so aggressively it hurts. Let's be honest. There's a return on your time investment if you get one client, or you know we were down in Columbus last week. Well, it was a big time and time investment, but it, as long as we get one client out of it ends up being worth our time. Particularly when you're a small business, remember that every client counts. Um, there's, we do, if you talk to us more, and I realize this, I was about to say, uh, we talk a lot, but it's the first time we've mentioned it. Clients one through five are your test cases, basically. Once you get past your fifth client, then you then you, for one thing, you should be an expert at how to interact with clients, how to sell them, how to upsell them. So, you know, giving them one service and then saying, I think this would really add value to whatever you're doing and, you know, get the ball rolling there. Once you're past that fifth client, you're outside, you're probably, you might already be, but you're outside of friends and family connections. You're into people who found out about you because of what you did on the first five clients. Um, and you've set the groundwork for continuing success in the future. So any questions on that? So we haven't asked any. We haven't asked. You I mean, it's like, it's um, highly market dependent how you get your first five clients. Yeah. I'll be honest, but um, we can, we're going to be hanging around for a while after the talk if anyone wants to yeah. chat. Well, let's um yeah let's go into how you live through this. <laughs> Anyone gets this, they get a book. Automatically. Automatically. You can talk to us later if you know it, but oh, and no one even close. That's good. Don't just work. You'll die. Yeah, don't you need to have something, you won't have much time for it. But you need to know how to if you can you have to deal with stress effectively. You have to deal with mental and physical stress effectively. There's gonna be times like I may go, you know, we're gonna say we have to take there's a day off. Or I've you know, I've seen you too much in the past X amount of time, I don't need to see you anymore or we'll go insane. We'll take X amount of time off or like these next two hours or you know, whatever. Working for yourself also you know, you can set the good parts of, you can take a good, like a good corporate culture thing and you can say, you know, we're going to take an hour middle of the day because we have time and we're going to get uh, ice cream every day. There's something, you know, you could do something that like you would, something you would enjoy that gives you a break. You take a break to, to do something. Take breaks, have a social circle and network outside of mm -hmm. what your every type of company thing that you're doing. Um, have a hobby, just something that you can work on that you don't want to get what will happen it'll take over you don't want to get into conversations where you're in a social thing and people are like you're just talking about your work non-stop because that's all you have because all you're doing and it gets kind of frightening so you need to have something that's completely not what you're doing for instance i, I dropped earlier that i'm working on a non-profit non arts consortium i'm part of a performing arts troupe that does absolute random insanity very similar to this movie by the way but that won't help any of you get it Yes, I mean that's something we don't mention when we're talking to, let's say, uh, you know, a government client or something. Oh yeah, perform we do crazy performing arts. Okay, you know, it's not. But so you need something. You need to have your own have your own thing that people don't, you know, that you can deal with outside of this. And if you're having a tough time and you're stressed, don't fight. Stop. Relax. Do something else. Right, recognizing your limitations when it comes to stress and the amount of effort that you can put into things. Very, very important. Yeah, it's a hundred times better to say, I need to take a step back right now rather than taking, you know, way over and kill and destroying yourself because you're going to get sick. You'll get sick, you'll be down for a couple weeks, you'll 
do poor work at some point you know you hit that you hit the point where everything you're doing is completely counterproductive because you, you start insane. misspelling things yeah you start misspelling things <laughs> okay actually that's a lie I misspell things even when I'm perfectly fine <laughs> Striped, striped, striped. So I mean, this is you know, this is stuff that this is stuff that seems like oh, you're like yeah, I know how to you know, I have a personal life, I can deal with this stuff. But it's just something you have to consciously pay attention to when you're doing this. It seems, it seems obvious, but it's not because you get caught up and you get so worried about something, or you're getting you're so engrossed in it, you forget that if I stop and breathe for fi even 15 minutes, then my life is going to be better. It's Everything's the gonna be better. it's the way to prevent like. You know, it's very possible for you to get four months into a company and suddenly say, I'm working more, I don't feel any better, and I'm not making as much money as my last job. Crap. <laughs> you know, um, and just being consciously aware to have a social life while you're doing that it will really make it a lot better and lay the groundwork so that later on you can actually stop working at six or something like that. Yeah, integrate integrate things that are integrate things that are fun and good parts of corporate culture if your corporate culture is to like we we watch movies clips clips of movies usually like five minute clips or something like start of the day usually mid midday i mean or you know there's little those are little fun things that like you stop and you see something it's kind of like you know sometimes we get to the point where we're like okay out ridiculous each other on the movie but uh but you know, there's, there's a little good things like that that you can't do in the corporate environment, and some of the better ones do integrate, like a lot of advertising or marketing firms, or a lot of things do integrate cool things like that or goofy things. You know, that could make that a part of your corporate culture. You don't have to be, you know, really. And you know, we're not trying to scare people off by saying corporate culture, but if you're working with someone else, you have a corporate culture. Be conscious about that and make sure that you cultivate it in a good direction. Read books. There's a lot of good management books. A lot of them are awful, and particularly since they repeat themselves a lot, you can just skim through it and pick out the important details, like take a break, throw a party. He's a birthday boy. He's quoting from the movie, Sorry. nobody knows. Sorry. <laughs> See, that, that that's a good way to amuse yourself, inside jokes that no one understands, don't do in front of a client. <laughs> but I, I think we've gotten to the point, we've gotten, we've gone through this, we've gone you know, uh, why you would even want to do this, are you the kind of person that should do this, uh, how you would actually, who, who you're going to do it with, how would you actually start it, what does that mean, how do you, how do you look like a company, how do you deal with, the, deal with clients, how do you get more clients, and how do you live through it. So I think we've basically covered the whole spectrum of, you know, what you would do through this. Again, we couldn't, you know, we can't give you a could give you an MBA today, not, not that you necessarily want an MBA. You don't, there's no, if anyone was thinking, gosh, I should go to business school before I do this, do not. Ever. All you'll be is in debt. Yeah, all you'll be is in debt. I mean, there's no reason. There's no reason. There are, you know, a lot of, they're good. Uh, no, I, I was going to say if they really want to go to business school, they can. It does lead into some high paying jobs, but it's not essential. Yeah, you're kind of a cog in a machine if you go to business I believe school. that everyone here is intelligent and. <laughs> Well, yeah, I don't think you need that for business school. <laughs> okay, I didn't. Don't pay attention to the last part of what he just said, but hey, no. So I mean, you don't need. You know, you can learn. You can learn this stuff. You can learn this stuff on your own, and really, it, it, practical learning is the best possible way to do this. And of course, we're going to be hanging around uh, after the talk if people want to chat about any of the specifics, uh, like well, paperwork or something like that. Um, somebody call this. We get a book. Well, someone has to be able to know this one. One. Okay. Well, does any wait, wait, stop. Does anyone? Does anyone? Don't just give it away for that. Does anyone uh, think they have like two or three of the movies that we did? You two? No one else. Well, we only got. We, we may be able to give you a book at like two movies out of the. Well, wait, wait, wait. Let's, ten let's, that we did a show, which is. How how are we gonna do this? We can't well, they, we... they they can just come up. We can we have our copies okay. of the slides. We'll talk to them. So okay. come see us if you want a book. Are there any questions, by the way, that people would like answered and. Yeah. The big setting before we switch to Rose. You okay? Oh. Good. I'm glad you have three movies. I was talking about business questions. I, I understand. I understand the movie part of this presentation was the key, but <laughs> we certainly had a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. No, no, that's, that's no, fine. No, please. Our, our previous question asked answer ask her left, but.
Okay. We actually sort of purposely didn't cover that because I kind of feel like you guys should know open source at least a little bit. The things to do are stress open source's strengths and weaknesses. You know, don't maximize the strengths, minimize the, the weaknesses um, without lying. You know, open source has a lar has the potential to have a much larger user base, a much larger developer base. Um, generally, a lot of projects are multilingual, um, which, depending on what your client is, is very helpful. Um, talk about the advantages of extendability. You can add, add or we can add for you um, additional modules or um, components, um, anything along those lines. You can talk about you know what it already exists and the ability to um, tack on a, additional things that other people are developing that might be in the same field as you. There, there are a lot of good ways to promote open source. Um, yeah, and I mean, it comes down to you really have to make the best decision for the client. Which, yeah. Because that's the that best decision for you in the long run, too, because they need to trust your business. Because if you do something that doesn't work out for them, like when we talked about payroll HR, there's a situation where we might, at all times, we're going to, you know, because that's what we believe what we do is we're mm -hmm. going to push open source. But if Except we know, for not, not HR and payroll. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for example, that's, that's an example. If there's a situation where the client, we know absolutely that that the only solution is I mean if you if you recommend people to other places they're going to say they're looking out for my best interest and they'll come back to you again when they need you know an email infrastructure which in open source is very good at um, you know that's okay okay um, it's tr it's okay let me I'm trying to think of a good example CRM systems um, there are a heck of a lot of them customer relationship management uh, tracking leads contacts financials things like that what I do is I s pop open a spreadsheet and I list characteristics and uh, on the left hand side I list every product and I run through them and do evaluations I do test installs um, it's a lot of work, but you know, like I said, I refresh fresh meat every five and minutes. In, in some cases, some people have done done that kind of work. You know, if we don't, yeah, but yeah. but yeah, it, it just it, it depends. And and also, there sometimes one thing that happens a lot in open source with open source solutions is, well, two products might be very very similar. One has slightly better strengths in one area than in another. Happens all the time with groupware, which there are fifteen million of. Um, and that really comes down to what best fits the client's yeah. needs and what best fits what you're able to provide and give support to. Um, I know Java probably least well of all the programming languages that I know. And so when it comes down to two equal open source products, I'll go for the one that's written in you know, it's like C++ over the one that's written in Java, just because I know I can provide better support for that. Yeah, obviously. I mean, first of all, we I mentioned it briefly earlier, but don't lie to them about where it came from. Say, you know, this isn't necessarily something that I wrote, but it's something that I'm intimately familiar with. Um, I do know the guts of PHPBB, for instance, forward and backwards, um, and can provide incredibly good support for that and submit bug reports on it. Um, so telling them where it came from, telling them where they can, you know, get additional information on it is always a good good idea to do. Then you know, depending depending on what your skill set is, contribute what you can. Maybe that's just you know donating back to the project, and how much you donate just financially. I mean, in this case, is up to you. You should give something back. I'm a huge proponent of that. Um, for instance, in a lot of what we do, usability suggestions, it's a big deal. Um, because like I said, secretary safe is a, word, is a phrase that we've dropped a couple times. And it's a hard demographic to crack in, into, particularly with open source software sometimes. Um, bug reports, you know, the, tr the traditional things. Um, and if you're a programmer, um, maybe one of your other project things that you work on is 
actually working on the project. Um, I, I, did that answer your question? I, I think maybe enough. Okay, the first thing that I that I do um, when I'm investigating a software field, let's. Grouper is a good example, actually, um, just because there's so many. I sort by last release date all the time um, and pay attention to how long it's been in existence and how active the development community is around it. Um, that's a major issue for me personally. Um, there, now, that's not to say that there aren't a lot of really good stable projects that are old. Um, task management, they're my favorite I've lost its name actually because the URL is just tasks for me. But task management software, there's some really good projects that had their last release in 2003 that work perfectly well. It's not, you know, an instant red flag, but if you had one release and, you know, Freshbean has that sort of activity range type of thing, if you, if it looks like you only had one release way back when, you're not the first one I'm going to look at. Um, I don't. I don't fall into uh, developer hero worship. Um, like, I only use Bernstein products or something like that. So, that's just not things that I evaluate on. Any other uh, questions? All right. Thank you very much. We've. If you didn't grab one of these 16 questions you should ask yourself uh, when starting a business, it's just handy things that'll help you guide in creating a business plan. We've got cards yeah, if you want to grab one. Incredible business card. Oh, God. If, you, if you're interested in contacting us later, if questions come up, we'll be more than welcome to answer, happy, happy <laughs> to answer them. Yeah. Um, and anyone who thinks that they might be in a running for a book, it looks like the bottom cutoff is two, I think. You could identify two of our 12 movies, mm -hmm. you're good to go. So come on up, we'll give you things. Thank you very much.